Imagine waking up not in tomorrow, not the next century, but in the year 3906. This is the enigmatic story of Paul Amadeus Dienach, a Swiss-Austrian teacher who spent an entire year in this distant future. What did he see? Well, buckle up because this is not your typical time travel tale. What if the fabric of time is not as linear as we perceive it? And could a man's diary hold the secrets to a future that transcends our wildest imagination? The plot thickens as we navigate the intriguing twists and turns of Dinoch's story about spending a year in 3906. We delve into Dinoch's detailed accounts of the future, the rise and fall of civilizations, the transformation of human nature, and the evolution of man into a new and improved species. This is what Paul Amadeus Dienach saw. According to Giorgios Papachazzis, the translator of the original manuscripts and someone who personally knew him, Paul Amadeus Dienach was a Swiss-Austrian teacher whose health was fragile. Born in a Zurich suburb to a German-speaking Swiss father and an Austrian mother from Salzburg, Dienach spent his adolescence in a village near the Swiss capital. His educational path led him to humanitarian studies with a strong focus on the history of cultures and classical philology. Dienach reportedly suffered from encephalitis lethargica, a peculiar neurological condition triggered by an immune system response to overloaded neurons. He first experienced a lethargic sleep in 1917, lasting for 15 days. Subsequently, in 1921, he fell into a year-long coma. After recovering from this extended slee, Dinoch embarked on a journey to Greece in the autumn of 1922, hoping the mild climate would improve his health. Despite not openly discussing his extraordinary experiences, he meticulously documented his memories of glimpses into the future during his time in Greece. Dinoch's journey to the future unfolded during a period of financial struggle. He relied on teaching French and German to make ends meet. With his remarkable memory and discretion, he hesitated to share his extraordinary experiences openly, possibly due to the fear of societal judgment. One of his students, Georgios Papachatsis, played a crucial role in his story. Papachatsis, who admired Dienach's cautious and modest demeanor, later became the custodian of Dienach's profound revelations. He immersed himself in the translation of a diary that would unravel the mysteries of a year spent in the distant year 3906. It is believed that Dinoch succumbed to tuberculosis, either in Athens, Greece, or while returning to his homeland through Italy. It was most likely during the first quarter of 1924. He confided in Papachazis, handing over a significant part of his life and soul, his diary. Dienach left him with notes without explicitly informing Papachazis, instructing him to improve his German by translating the documents from German to Greek. Initially, Papachazis assumed Dienach had written a novel, but as he delved into the translation, he realized that the notes were, in fact, Dienach's diary from the future. Papachazis translated the pages, uncovering extensive passages that delved into a foreseen nuclear war, the colonization of Mars, and the establishment of a global government. Sections detailing flying vehicles, holographic technology, and encounters with alien life intrigued Papachazis and initially led him to believe it was a science fiction novel. Dienach chronicled an extraordinary journey, describing how he slipped into a coma in 1921 and awoke 2,000 years in the future, specifically in 3,906. He spent an entire year in this distant future, meticulously documenting everything he observed. Dinoch's story unfolds in May 1921. While teaching his college language class, he suddenly feels dizzy. Given his history of illness, he ends up in the hospital, succumbing to a severe fever. During the next few hours of being in and out of consciousness, he perceives unfamiliar individuals surrounding him, but his weakness prevents communication. Upon finally regaining consciousness, 
he finds himself in a hospital room drastically different from what he knows. Several people are dressed in unknown attire, conversing in a language foreign to him. As a language teacher, Dinoch finds himself thrust into a reality that challenges the boundaries of time and perception. Recognizing a few words in English and Swedish, Dinoch attempts to communicate, but his efforts are met with confusion. Among the medical staff, one doctor discerns his language and, in broken German, tells Dinoch who he is. According to the doctor, Dinoch's name is Andreas Northam, a renowned physics professor who was involved in a near-death accident. Dinoch, however, has no idea who Andreas Northam is. When shown a mirror, he is confronted with a stranger's face, prompting visible distress and tears. He questions if he is dead or perhaps gone mad. He explains that he is a simple language teacher from Switzerland, utterly bewildered by the unfolding events. The mention of Switzerland sparks some reactions among the medical team. Inquiring about the year, Dinoch confidently states it is 1922. A solemn hush descends as an older physician steps forward, revealing that, in actuality, the year is 3906. Dinoch vehemently rejects this revelation, but then the blinds are raised revealing towering buildings reaching through the clouds and gravity defying vehicles outside his window. He succumbs to the overwhelming spectacle and blacks out. Over the next three days of careful observation, Dinoch gradually recovers enough to walk. He describes an otherworldly environment with crystal walls offering scenic views and objects crafted from pastel-colored glowing metal that was warm to the touch. Guided through a corridor, he encounters two older men in white robes. Initially mistaking them for priests or kings, he later learns they are called electors with an eye, akin to wise elders. Until this point, the doctors doubted Dianoc's claim of being from the past, attributing it to potential brain trauma. However, after extensive questioning, the electors believe Dianoc's account. They are familiar with a rare psychic phenomenon they term a consciousness shift, positing that his mind or soul was transported into another's body. This is a rare phenomenon that they believe explains Dinoch's extraordinary journey through time. When Andreas Northam, whose body now housed the consciousness of Dinoch, suffered a critical accident, he was clinically dead for 15 minutes. Doctors managed to restart his heart, employing techniques such as lowering the temperature of his brain. The electors believed the personality shift occurred during this revival, transferring Paul Dianoc's mind 2,000 years into the future to inhabit the body of Andreas Northam. Contemplating the mechanics of this consciousness journey, Dianoc queried the electors about the nature of time. They explained that time isn't strictly linear. All consciousness exists universally, even though such rare events are known to happen. At this juncture, a man named Stefan is summoned. Being a close friend of Andreas Northam, Stefan and the doctors were entrusted with knowing Northam's true identity. To the rest of the world, Dinoch assumed Northam's life. The electors believed that if Stefan could help Northam regain his memories, the personality shift might be reversed, and Dinoch could return to his own time. Stefan agreed to visit Dinoch daily to educate him about modern society. However, Dinoch's primary interest lay in understanding the past. Despite the doctors in 3906 grasping the psychic personality shift, a perplexing aspect lingered from the 1920s. Back then, Dinoch suffered from encephalitis lethargica, or sleeping sickness, a condition that impairs speech, movement, and wakefulness. Intriguingly, despite living two weeks in the future, Dinoch never slept, staying awake throughout the night, reading and learning the new language, and engaging with the Reagan Schwager, a novel piece of technology resembling a handheld device with moving three-dimensional images. The device glows in the dark, complete with sound, music, and narration, an early version of an iPad. Essentially, Dinoch delved into learning. However, the doctors restricted his study of the 20th century, fearing any knowledge that could alter historical events. Instead, 
Dinoc focused on the challenging years 2000 through 2300. He studied the human race's struggles with overpopulation and regional conflicts and gained insights into the difficulties faced in the future. After more than 60 years of progress, Mars was finally colonized, with the population growing to 20 million. However, in 2265, a catastrophic event, possibly a large impact, led to the total collapse of the Martian colony, and subsequent attempts at colonization were abandoned. In 2309, a medium-scale nuclear war ravaged most of Europe, sparing only the Baltic and Scandinavian countries. This event is believed to be the reason for their language, a hybrid of English and Scandinavian. The global nuclear war that ensued lasted for 80 years, decimating much of the human population. In 2396, a new world government called Red Stott emerged, marking the end of the ancient period of history and ushering in the beginning of the modern era. Initially corrupt and controlled by the wealthy elite, the government faced resistance worldwide for about 200 years due to strong local nationalism. Eventually, a transformation occurred, shifting away from electing politicians and businessmen. Higher offices came to be occupied by scientists, philosophers, and humanitarians. Society started to reform, and in 2823, a world leader named Torahild proposed a novel economic system. Unlike the previous system based on global scarcity, this new system focused on global adequacy. People worked for the greater good for 40 years in their chosen field. After the 40 years, they retired with all their material needs met by the global community. Technological progress and automation advanced to a point where, by the time Paul Dinoch arrived in 3906, individuals worked only two years of their lives. Childhood education led to workforce entry at age 17, then intensive work for two years before retirement. Material needs including shelter, food, clothing, education, and entertainment were provided, and conventional money was replaced by a system valuing art and science. Pursuing a career became optional, allowing for a life of leisure as long as the two years of service were completed. This situation does seem reminiscent of socialism and communism, which often fail, adding a fascinating twist to the narrative. Why do these systems fail? Well, the fundamental issue lies in the presence of selfish individuals, as no matter how generous most people are, there are always those who crave more. Human nature gets in the way. However, by the year 3906, humanity has undergone a profound transformation. But this change is not in the way we traditionally think of ourselves. We have evolved into something else. Paul Dinoch describes a phenomenon that began around the year 3000, known as needlework or needlework. In the future, the structure of the human brain evolves, leading to the development of a new sense organ. This sense organ grants people the ability to perceive a new plane of existence and access vast spiritual knowledge, a capability referred to as oversin or supervision. This newfound cognitive ability promises instant enlightenment, sounding rather appealing. However, this new sense doesn't necessarily bring incredible happiness and spiritual peace. Instead, it is described as a profound joy, acceptance of death, and a disregard for worldly matters, all flooding in at once. People initially freaked out, and those who experienced the needlework would die, overwhelmed by the intensity. Yet, on September 6, 3,382, a 76-year-old man named Alexis Volki survived the needlework, marking a turning point. From then on, everyone who underwent the needlework survived. The activation of this new perception became commonplace, leading to the evolution of Homo sapiens into a new species. This development leads to the birth of Homo occidentalis novus, or the new Western man, in this future, human nature itself transforms. Unlike present humans who are hardwired for survival, competition, and success even at the expense of others, the people of 3906 hardly need laws. They work for the common good because that is how they have evolved. 
Selfishness is viewed as an archaic remnant of a less evolved species, and individuals in 3906 can't even fathom acting in ways that are normalized today. Paul Dinoch finds the future inhabitants quite peculiar, describing them as acting like carefree children. Yet deep down, one can't deny the allure of returning to childhood when all needs were met and there was no fear, envy, or anxiety. As Dinoch's friend Stefan aptly notes, what some may see as strange behavior could indeed be viewed as either childish or divine, an intriguing perspective. However, Dinoch raises concerns about how these seemingly carefree people would handle an external threat, especially contact with aliens. Stefan reassures him, revealing that such encounters have happened multiple times with no adverse consequences. Future humans are aware of intelligent beings within the solar system and galaxy, yet they prefer distant observation over direct communication. Stefan acknowledges a few instances where these extraterrestrial beings intervened, particularly during critical moments in human history. Reflecting on his past, Dinoch recalls a poignant moment from his youth when he fell in love with Anna, a girl from his village. Despite their mutual feelings, circumstances dictated otherwise, and they had a final moment together on a hill adorned with white buttercups. Anna promised to return and make a wreath of windflowers for Paul, but sadly he never saw her again, a lingering torment throughout his life. After spending a year with the people of 3906, Dinoch connects with a woman named Sylvia. During a day trip in a flying vehicle called Avigiosa, capable of near instantaneous travel, Dinoch decides to revisit his old village. Unaware of their destination, Sylvia and Dinoch spend the day conversing and exploring, eventually finding themselves on the same hill where Paul and Anna shared their last moments. Windflowers bloom once again, and as they sit and talk, Sylvia crafts a wreath of windflowers. Recalling Anna's words, she looks at Paul Dianoch and says, Enough for today. Let's go back. She hands him the wreath and asks him to place it on her head, a moment that feels like a bolt of lightning for Dianoch. This event is the sign he has been praying for his entire life. Later, he reflects on the day with Stefan, who reminds him of the non-linear nature of time. Stefan then proposes a belief in reincarnation. According to Stefan, Sylvia is the reincarnated soul of Anna, fulfilling her promise after 2,000 years. That night, as Dinoch feels his eyes growing heavy, he wonders if he will finally find restful sleep from then on. His last thought centers on how much he missed this feeling, and Andreas Northam finally falls asleep for the first time in a year. In 1922, Paul Dinoch awakens from a year-long coma, concluding the captivating story. However, the integrity of Dinoch's experiences remains a mystery. Was his story genuinely a paranormal journey 2,000 years into the future? Dinoch's extensive book, filled with intricate details about future technology and a richly detailed world vision, lends some credence to his account. Alternatively, it's possible that during his coma, Dinoch experienced vivid dreams that he interpreted as reality, constructing an elaborate vision of the future. Yet another theory to consider is that Paul Amadeus Dinoch never existed. Despite being discussed in various blogs, podcasts, and videos, the commonly used photo of Paul is a mugshot of Daniel Towhill, arrested for theft in New Zealand in 1908. Moreover, the records of Zurich and Athens, where Dinoch supposedly lived and taught, show no trace of anyone by that name or similar variations. Georgios Papachatsis, the book's translator and publisher, attempted to locate Dienach years later, but claimed difficulty due to Dienach's name change after serving in World War I. The mystery deepens as the true identity of Paul Amadeus Dienach remains elusive. The situation is indeed convenient, but what's even more convenient is the disappearance of the original handwritten diary. According to Papachatsis, while residing in Greece during the war, his house underwent a search by the Greek military. 
the notes, being in German, were confiscated by the soldiers and never returned, a suspicious turn of events. The skepticism deepens when others observe the parallels between this narrative and H.P. Lovecraft's story, The Shadow Out of Time. Lovecraft's tale, written in the first person like a diary, features a protagonist who slips into a coma and awakens in a different time. But while Dinoch awakens in the future, Lovecraft's hero emerges in the past. Despite the distinctions, the similarities raise eyebrows. Considering that The Shadow Out of Time was published in 1936, it questions whether Dinoch's story, if inspired by Lovecraft, could have been written in the 1920s. Does this imply that the Greek individual crafted a hoax? Contrary to such suspicions, Georgios Papachatsis, a highly respected law professor and intellectual, lends credibility to the narrative. Having served as a jurist on Greece's Council of State, comparable to a Supreme Court, Papachatsis was a serious and reputable individual. His academic interests in administrative law, social studies, and humanities align with the themes found in Paul Dianoc's diary. It is plausible that the book was conceived as an intellectual exercise, an exploration of human spirituality, with Papachatsis incorporating the science fiction twist and the love story as literary devices. While his intent may not have been to present it as an actual occurrence, the age of the internet has blurred the lines between fiction and reality, with people readily inclined to believe such stories. Could Dinoch's accounts be mere dreams? The possibility of a strange metaphysical event with alternative explanations arises. No one can verify the extraordinary experiences of a man who seemingly endured more than the human mind can comprehend. However, specific scientific facts, such as the 1918 flu outbreak and the subsequent sleeping sickness in the 1920s, add complexity to the narrative. This mysterious illness, encephalitis lethargica, induced a state of paralysis and coma-like conditions, affecting the brain and leaving victims in a state similar to the living dead. Whether Dinoch's story is a product of insight, hallucination, a fairy tale, or a genuine account of time travel remains open to individual interpretation. One piece of advice is offered. The true essence of the diary lies in its contents, leaving each reader to ponder and decide for themselves. Thank you for watching another episode of Voyager. While you are still here, click on the video on your screen to see more mind-blowing videos like this one.